I talked about knowledge management a little bit previously, um, mentioning that knowledge management isn't really limited to the service transition phase. It should begin when you first start thinking about a particular service, um, so in the service strategy phase phase of the life cycle, and it continues through service operations. So on a day-to-day -day basis, you're gathering more knowledge even once, once the service is in operation. The idea here for knowledge management is that we need to develop context and better understanding. Um, once a service is in the live environment, we are going to gather data. From data, we develop information about that service from information, knowledge, and ultimately wisdom to have uh, so that we can better support the applications and services that we are providing and so that we can better inform our end users. Again, training and knowledge leads to better understanding on the part of our end users and overall increased satisfaction of our customers. So those are the, the processes that I wanted to cover in service transition. Um, I am going to touch on service operation briefly. Uh, this is, of course, what I'll be going into, uh, I'll be covering next week in, or in two weeks in more depth. But with service operation, one thing that I wanted to, um, uh, to mention is that in service operation, Uh, you know, we talked about, in change management, we talked about normal and standard changes. Um, and although both incidents and service requests are submitted to the service desk, um, service requests actually go back to change management. So, Standard changes are often seen or often defined as service requests within the organization. And service requests are resolved or the resolution is provided by the request fulfillment process. So we often refer to these service requests, so a request for a new laptop, um, a request for onboarding a new uh, user within the organization. Those are service requests which can also be defined as standard changes. Um, with, in the example of onboarding a new employee, it may be the manager who provides the local authority or the, the authorization for that particular change. It may happen that the incident can lead to a service request a standard change or an access request to resolve the incident. So there is a connection there between incidents and changes, or there could be potentially a, a relationship there. Um, but service requests don't go back to the incident management process. It's, it's actually the request fulfillment process. Regardless of whether you're using an incident form to log the information, it's the type of request that's important here. So it's, the point essentially is that um, you should understand that incidents and service requests are two distinct types of requests. They should be tracked separately, um, flagged separately, reported on separately. Service requests are more closely tied into and related to the standard changes in the service transition phase of the life cycle. I mentioned continual service improvement, um, the fifth phase of the life cycle that surrounds the other phases. This focuses on introducing improvements for the various services that the team supports. And the basis of this continual service improvement model is the Deming cycle, so if you've ever heard of the Deming cycle, it's more common in manufacturing history and terminology, but it's simply the idea that you plan, 
you do or implement, you check or report, and then take corrective action based on, on that to then start the cycle all over again. As part of continual service improvement, we develop what are called key performance indicators. Um, these are the most critical metrics that we gather, um, and they should be based on our critical success factors. So to give you some ideas of key performance indicators or metrics related to change management, um, we can see, for example, if it's important for our organization that we are able to make changes quickly and accurately, then we want to be sure that we are, um, if we're focused on the accuracy port part of it, we want to be sure that if we're keeping track of incidents caused by changes, we want to see that reduced. We want to reduce the number of outages caused by poorly implemented changes, and we certainly want to see a reduction in emergency changes. Um, a high number of emergency changes indicates a large risk for the organization and really a poorly managed uh, change process. We also have KPIs for release management. Um, again, this focus here on testing. We want to be sure that uh, we're tracking releases and showing the testing that's been done. Similar to emergency changes, we want to reduce the number of urgent releases. We also want to reduce, of course, failed releases or incidents caused by releases. So we can see and link back uh, incidents if we notice that they are caused by a particular, particular release. For knowledge management, to see success in knowledge management, so we may want to see um, incidents resolved by knowledge articles. So if we link an incident to a knowledge article, especially if it's resolved on the first call. Also, just having um, knowledge at articles added to the knowledge base. We want to be sure that the knowledge is kept up to date, but certainly that as we grow the knowledge base um, and make it accessible to the uh, tier one staff and even end users, um, the better potential we have to either avoid incidents altogether or at least reduce the amount of time that it takes to restore service after an incident. The last set of KPIs we'll look at is for IT service asset and configuration management. We want to be sure we um, understand what, how many CIs we have in our environment. Um, sometimes customers are surprised when we implement our uh, discovery tools to, to see how many assets actually exist uh, in the, in, within their environment. We want to be sure that there's no unauthorized software out there. That's where the uh, definitive media library can come in handy for keeping track of, of software licenses that are out there. And then finally, exception reports. So um, we may even want to see, you know, if we look at our changes and look at the, the baseline of our CIs, um, Baseline compared to the current state of a CI, if those are not, if the um, if a particular CI has changed, there should be a corresponding change request or approved change request associated to that CI. So, in some organizations that that have gone um, that have really gotten advanced with the way they're tracking their changes, um, they should be able to see that the the baseline of a CI plus any approved changes should equal the current state of that CI. And that way you can um, make sure that there are no unauthorized changes occurring within the environment. So to recap, we've looked at the, um, to this point, three phases of the service life cycle as defined by ITIL version 3. 
There is a lot of complimentary guidance out there as well. I would encourage you all to um, look at some of the additional resources in addition to the five core life cycle books. There is a lot of thought leadership out there. Um, we have data sheets and other webinar recordings on our website. Uh, BMC also has a communities um, has communities and blogs that they offer uh, in addition to a number of um, idle framework documents. And there's a few organizations uh, with with whom we've partnered in the past and also um, that we're members of, including IT Service Management Foundation and um, HDI. And they can be other good sources of, of information related to IT service management.